This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of The Lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. Lewis and Clark could hear the falls for hours before they came upon them. Could feel their pull. The quickening of the waters somewhere below. Felt it for miles. Lewis and Clark could tell something big was coming as soon as they'd entered the gorge. So could the 30 other men, and one woman, and one baby, whose names at moments like this in the story of their famous journey across the continent get washed away until they too become simply Lewis and Clark. They let the current take them, faster now, down the Columbia, so named by an Englishman who'd come up the river from the west. No man, no American man anyhow, had come down the river from the other side. So Lewis and Clark didn't know exactly where the quickening water was pulling them. They'd been told to expect some rapids, some cascades, to expect salmon in exceptional numbers. So they'd been told by the leader of a band of Indians they'd met months back, a people who'd called themselves the Namipu, but whom Lewis and Clark called the Nez Perce, the Pierce Nose. And so that's what we call them now too. And the river pulled them toward the falls, surely large falls, but there was also the ocean. This was finally the river that would lead them to the Pacific after 17 months of toil and trial. They wouldn't get out, wouldn't try to carry their boats through the forest, over the hills that cradled the river. They would try to keep their boats upright and try to brave whatever was ahead. But nothing the Nez Perce had told them prepared them. Not for the salmon, the sheer volume, the shimmering wave beneath all the roiling, and not for the rapids, so fierce, the whirlpools and rip currents and falls, more wild, more frightening, than either man had ever seen, or any of the other men for that matter, the woodsmen, the boatmen, the rivermen. Salilo Falls. That's what the native peoples called this place, the echo of falling water. If Lewis and Clark weren't struggling so at that moment, they could have stopped to ask them. There were hundreds there on the shore. They'd come there to fish, as their ancestors had done for as far into the past as their stories traveled. For 12,000 years, archaeologists now tell us. That's how long people had been fishing at Salilo Falls. But on this day in 1805, the Wishram, the Wasco, and others from the other tribes of the Northwest gathered at the edge of the falls to watch these strange men die and then take all their stuff. But we don't still remember these strange men. Don't still refer to them all as merely Lewis and Clark and not something like the doomed expedition of 1805 or Jefferson's Folly or whatever, if they die right here. They die right here, and Salilo Falls becomes Lewis and Clark Falls, for sure. It becomes a kind of Donner Pass in the American imagination. They made it through. Much the surprise of the people on shore, who went back to their fishing, as their people had done for as far back as their stories traveled, and as they surely always would, and much to the surprise of the people who lived beyond the falls, just downriver. They were surprised these men had survived, but not necessarily surprised to have men like them show up, because they'd seen Englishmen before, and Canadians, and American sailors who'd come in from the Pacific and up from the other side of the Columbia. The new people had started coming several years before, though somehow word hadn't entirely gotten to Lewis and Clark, who marveled at the English words they heard from these natives. Musket, son of a bitch and marveled at their wooden houses, 
things they hadn't seen since they left Illinois. And at this teeming metropolis, there on the river, 10,000 people strong, they figured. The 10th largest city in America right then. If anyone in the eastern cities would deign to accept these people as Americans. And that 10,000 would swell when the salmon really ran. Lewis and Clark had seen nothing, it seemed. There were months each year when tribes converged from all corners of this corner of the land to drop nets from the rocks, to spear fish from the shore, to build platforms and bridges over the eddies and whirlpools and waves, to trade and meet, to hear word of the wide world beyond the falls. But Lewis and Clark couldn't stick around. They had to see some more of that world for themselves. There are photographs taken in the second half of the 19th century. And the falls in those pictures must look a lot like the ones Lewis and Clark saw. The same ones that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people saw for thousands upon thousands of years. You can see some of those people at the edge of the water, looking much the same as they did in 1805 and 1705, with poles and spears and braids and woven blankets, white water rippling around them, hauling nets as they had for so long, as they surely always would. The pictures start to change toward the end of the century, starting with pilings and planks and platforms, permanent things to stand on, to fish from, to speed up the process. When you get to the 1900s, you see contraptions, semi-automatic salmon scooping systems put in by the large fishing concerns. There are Kodachrome pictures from the 50s. They are something to see, if only because they are your last chance to see the falls. Because a dam went up in 1957, not far up the river. The state of Oregon was swept up in a wave of dam building that raced across the United States in the middle of the last century. It was the new way to fill our bath and the glass by our bedstand, and to light the lamp beside it. And it was the new way to tame our rivers, once and for all. The ones that had bedeviled boaters since Lewis and Clark had made planting and sowing so unpredictable, and had in 1948 destroyed a town just downriver from Celilo, just washed it away. So up went a dam, upriver from Celilo Falls, and up went the water. As it had in Barkhampstead Hollow and Heartland Hollow, whose houses now rest beneath the Barkhampstead Reservoir in Connecticut and in Cooper City, and Elmore, and Etter, and Kennett, and Morley, and more towns sunk beneath Shasta Lake, since they stopped up the Sacramento River and the waters there rose. As they rose over the playgrounds of Olive Bridge and Ashton, the ball fields of Brown Station, now at the bottom of the Ashokan Reservoir in New York. As they rose over the ballroom in Enfield, Massachusetts, where its people danced one last time and sang Old Lang Syne, before a dam made sure the swift river was swift no more, and the waters rose and rose. And though we can't see that dance floor anymore, we can see some poetry in it, in the thought of a woman who may have stepped outside on that last night, in her best dress, to get some air and to look up at the stars, where soon would only be water. But there was a ballroom in Belchertown, just up the road, in a new home, in a new reservoir where her old one used to be, whose surface reflected those stars. On the last day of Celilo Falls, hundreds of people, whose ancestors had fished those waters for as far back into the past as their stories traveled, stood on the banks as in 1805. And they watched the water rise and rise, until the falls fell silent, as they will surely always be. <laughs>